Let's start out how I got involved with this. This, this happened a long time ago with the first uh, first movie. Long, long time ago. I was about five years old, I think. <laughs> they brought me into audition for the film, and uh, I got the part of Bato, and I thought, wow, this is really a cool movie. I really loved it, fell in love with it. And uh, that was it. You know, we did the movie, and they actually they had the theatrical uh, release of it, so that was kind of cool to go into theaters and actually see it and go, wow, that's kind of cool. And then, um, as it turns out, that, that particular movie, The First Ghost in the Shell, was, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but it was the largest selling video of the year. The largest selling video. That includes Warner Brothers, Paramount, Sony Pictures, I mean, everybody. It was the largest selling video of the year the year came out, which is pretty freaking amazing. So, uh, later on, they came out with a... Uh, a series. And I thought, oh great, they had this series, I'm, you know, I'm a shoe in because I did the movie, right? And then I can get a call from these guys. They said, hey, we got this series. It's Ghost in the Shell. I said, yeah, great, I know. Yeah, it's wonderful. Go, we'd like you to come in an audition. <laughs> I said, what? I said, yeah, we'd like you to come in an audition. I said, oh, okay. In my head, I'm going, you mother <laughs> It's an audition, really? Yeah, come in, okay, I'll come in. So anyway, I went in there and I auditioned. There was about 200 guys reading for this part, and I I went in and auditioned. I think I got it because I sound like the guy in the movie. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there was uh, the only two of us that made the cut was uh, was William Knight and myself, and uh, and I was very grateful that I got to do the series. It was great. And then from there, we did a bunch of different movies and, and all that. And it was kind of a, a lock for it after that. And then I became involved when we acquired Ghost in the Shell to Ghost in the Shell to Innocence, and uh, I, I was cast as Haraway, but our company produced and Richard directed the dub and adapted and adapted. Of course. <laughs> Never. And that's a crazy story. That's a really long, crazy story. I don't know if you guys want to hear that story or not, but it's pretty nutty. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Just gluttonous for punishment, aren't you? <laughs> well, actually, we were uh, we were visiting our son uh, in Boston. He was going to the Berkeley College of Music, and we went to a movie, and there was this big poster of Ghost in the Shell 2, and I'm going, wow, there's this movie coming out. There's a big picture of Bato in there. I'm going, that's cool. So... I, you know, I kind of put it in the back of my mind when I got back into L.A. I called up the guys that we do the, the series with, and I said, what's going on with this new movie? They said, well, we're not doing it. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we don't have the rights. DreamWorks has the rights to do this movie, and uh, we're not doing it. I said, oh, okay. So I used to, uh, I used to uh, uh, supervise for DreamWorks and Universal, and uh, were they like vivisecting the guy in the next room? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, somebody's chair fell on his foot. Uh, <laughs> is that, Private story. Is that the proctologist next door? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, so what happened was I went to, uh, I tried calling them. They never called me back. And I, as I said, I was a supervisor for them internationally and did a lot of big films for them. Uh, Galaxy Quest, Madagascar, uh, uh, Gladiator, a bunch of big films. So anyway, I couldn't get them to call me back. So we, I went to Otakon, and I found out that they were there. And I tried to hunt them down, and they had left. And I'm in a van. What the is going on over there? There's the wheel. <laughs> they always put me next to these crazy people or raves or something's going on. There's not. Anyway, uh, so to make a long story longer, uh, I'm in a van. I will kill her. I'm in a van, and I'm sitting next to this, this beautiful uh, Asian lady, and we start talking, and it turns out she's one of the producers of Ghost of the Shell. Someone doesn't like us. <laughs> Are they strangling the dolphin over there? <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, so I told her who I was, and she didn't really give a crap. And uh, uh, she basically told me the person to contact at DreamWorks. So I tried doing that, and I couldn't get through. So I basically kind of gave up. And you know, my thing was, if I couldn't do Bato, because it was with a big, big studio, I figured, well, they're going to have Johnny Depp do the voice of Bato now, or you know, <laughs> you know and Helen Bonham Carter was going to do, uh, you know, Harold and probably have, uh, what's his face, Tim Burton directed now. So I thought, I'm screwed. And I went to, uh, I was asked to go to a uh, uh, convention in London, and I was approached by Manga UK, and they said, you know, we really want to dub this because uh, DreamWorks released it. They finally released it without uh, dubbing it. They just basically released the sub, but it was a terrible. It was, it was one of those subs that is like basically for the hard of hearing, and they include every, like the chair moves, they put that in the sub, you know, <laughs> the door opens. I mean, it, it was a very convoluted script anyway, and it was really tough to follow and to have all that extra stuff, and it really made it difficult to follow, so. Uh, it, it just wasn't received very well, unfortunately. So, but also the movie is—it's—it's uh, it's very metaphorical, and so if you don't place the metaphors within a certain arena, if if you don't explain them in a language that the English-speaking audience can understand, a lot is going to be lost. Yeah, anyhow. Um, so they approached me, and, they, and Ellen and I have a company, Epcar Entertainment. It's a brilliant name, actually. I don't know how we ever came up with that. I'd just like to say that what was going on next door was not a pan. No? <laughs> it was a, a little girl just went in the front and started speaking into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds more interesting than what's going on in here. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... What happened was uh, they asked our company to bid on this, so we did. And uh, the next day, they basically called up and said, "We'd like you to do the dub of Ghost in the Shell too." And we were really happy because then it's you know it's like one of those things. Be careful what you wish for because I wanted to write it, direct it, and do the voice of Bato, and I got to do all those things. And for me, it was great because I finally actually got to do Bato the way I wanted to do Bato. Then not that I have anything against the guy who directs the series; he's a wonderful guy and a good director, but. You know, he and I don't didn't always see eye to eye on everything, and uh, and it was just nice to do the character the way I wanted to do him finally. So that was kind of cool for me to be able to do that. And the other thing is, uh, Richard has a great sense of humor, so he he brought some levity to the script where the script didn't have any before, and it was very very detailed. It was very very specific and. And, and so a lot of people, when they saw the original, they were totally lost as well. And so he brought levity to it, and um, it, a little bit, just a little bit. And, and it was just enough that uh, it, it, it was able to give it a little breath. Uh, Ghost in the Shell Innocence 2 is, is a very, very interesting film. The, the way I like to describe it, it's kind of like a haiku poem, a series of haiku poems. So you hear part of the poem, and then the, all of the action is frozen, and you hear the music. That is your time to reflect on the action that has just taken place, and it will go on for a minute. It's really long. And then some more action, some more dialogue will happen, and then it freezes frame, and you get some more music, more time to reflect. So it's really like a haiku poem, and a lot of people didn't understand that. Did you guys have trouble with that? Or no? Good. <laughs> but um, there, there were a lot of people that did have problems with it, so... Richard brought the levity to it, and, and it just made it perfect. It made it so much more understandable, truly. And then the, the weird thing was, about five years after we did our version of it, uh, uh, Bond and I decided they wanted to have their own version, so they did another version here in, uh, in America. And <laughs> I played Bato again. They had the Gitz team do the script and everything, so I was basically doing the same character in the same film with a different script, and that was kind of bizarre, quite frankly. <laughs> but I got paid, so it helped. <laughs> um, again, um, 
they had a different understanding and they pulled the levity out that Richard had brought to it. And, uh, and it's very, very specific and very detailed. And, um, yeah, they wanted it very, very close to the original, which is yeah, fine. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Ours was close to the original too. It just had a little bit of, you know, it sounded a little more conversational. The tough thing with that particular movie was they, they spoke in platitudes and it was really hard to make that sound like natural dialogue. And that was, the, that was the trick as a writer, to try to make it sound like people are actually talking to each other, because the, the whole movie, they're just basically, you know, quoting things and, and talking in platitudes, and it's just really hard to, you know, make it sound natural and normal, so that was the trick, but... Anyway, so I did the movie twice, and that was kind of weird, but it's fun. I love I love doing Bato. He's a great character, and I hope I get to do him in a rise. Otherwise, I'll, I'll call those guys back and you go through the <laughs> And I really enjoyed doing her away. She was, she had a, a voice that it was kind of like dried, crinkling leaves, and she was somewhat robotic. Somewhat. Yeah, she really was, and um, it was it was a fun, interesting character to do. It's nice to know in the future you can smoke cigarettes because it'll turn you into a robot, so it'll be okay. <laughs> So, what kind of questions do you guys have? Yeah, yes. Ask. Um, what was your favorite thing about playing Bato? Um, I just, I like him as a character. He's, he's just a fun guy to play. He's just this big, menacing guy who's tough as nails. But, you know, I, I mean, I kind of, I kind of, I really relate to him. Uh, he's, he's got a real soft side, a real, a real mushy inside, really. He's, he's really fair, and he's kind, and he's got a good sense of humor, and he's, uh, you know, but outwardly he's really tough and he won't take any crap from anyone. And I kind of, I, I like, I like that kind of uh, dichotomy about him. And he was fun. He's really fun to play, fun character. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, where did you get the inspiration uh, to voice your characters? Uh, well, for me, it's you know a lot of times, you know, it, it depends on what you're doing. For example, if you're doing an anime thing. It's already done. You basically go and you see a picture of the character. So, for me, I've been doing this a long time. I just go and look at the character, and, and a voice will come out of me. And it's just, it's kind of like it's already the computer just kind of makes it happen. You know what I mean? So, uh, I mean that's that's one way. And then there's you have original animation where you go in and you don't necessarily know what the character looks like, but they'll give you a kind of a written description of what he's like, and then you can come up with a voice. And that's actually sometimes that's more. Uh, you have to kind of be more inventive sometimes with that. Uh, for me, I'm kind of a visceral person, so I, when I see that picture, it just something, you know, a voice will come out and it, it'll hopefully be something that looks like it comes out of that character's mouth, you know. What about you? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, when you, when you look at a cartoon, you can, you can kind of feel the character. If you, if you see a, a, a very short, uh, short person, you're going to have a higher voice. If you see uh, a larger person, you might want to have a deeper uh, resonating tone. Um, and, and you can, and, and if somebody is long and skinny, then maybe they'll be, uh, they'll have a higher pitch. Um, so you get inspired when you look at a character, you know, and, and that's the way we do it. That was another thing I was happy I got to do in the, in my version of Ghost in the Shell Innocence because when we did the series, there's a thing where they, they compress the uh, the sound on all stuff that they do for television. The bottom because, is taken out. Yeah, they, they take the top the top frequency and the bottom frequency and they compress it. So everything sounds kind of equalized. And, and the way the reason they do that is because most people have not very good speakers on their TV. So it's, it comes out of a television speaker, so that's they compress it for that. So when we did mine, I, I said, don't take the bottom out of my voice. Because you look at Bontel, he's this big, he's a big guy. And I said, don't take the bottom out of my voice. And I wanted my voice to be booming, like, you know, my normal voice. So, so I, was, I was glad I was able to do that. And I think it sounds more authentic for him. I think it sounds more realistic coming out of his body. So, Questions? Yeah. Um, do you pay attention to the Japanese voice actors at all? Does that affect how you approach the character? Personally, um, I mean, a lot, it, you know, it really depends on where you're working, what show you're doing, uh, some, and who your client is. Some of the clients want it to be very close to the original. 
Some don't care. Personally, as an actor, I uh, a lot of times would listen to it for the timing, but uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to feel like I'm aping somebody or mimicking another actor's performance. I'd rather try to come up with something myself. You know. So. But but sometimes, I mean, the client will say to us, "We want the voices to match." Uh, I just dubbed into English these two French films. The, uh, did any of you see Amelie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's with Audrey Tattoo, and uh, the movie is called Delicacy. And so we were, I was, not me personally, I was directing, but I was uh, redubbing the, uh, the film. It's going to be on, uh, on Stars coming up very soon. Uh, anyhow, we did that, and then another one called Farewell, My Queen. Do you know that one? It was out recently. Story of Marie Antoinette. <laughs> anyhow, Is that the sequel to Hello, My King? Ha, ha, ha. Anyhow. It's worth a shot. <laughs> anyhow, but the voices in those needed to be matched. And I'm not meaning spot on, but the performance was uh, were, were so good that you wanted to at least come uh, into those performances and match them. And we didn't, and, and so that was part of the job. But here we were in uh, Ghost in the Shell, and that wasn't the case. However, Richard got a job uh, because he sounded... He, he got a job because he sounded like another actor. The Billy Zane story. Mm -hmm. No, that's not, that's not the I mean, No. <laughs> She's talking about Ansem. I play, we have a Kingdom Hearts fans here. Well, I play Ansem in Xehanort and uh, Terran Nord in, in Kingdom Hearts. And the reason I got that job was because the guy who does those voices in Japan right. does the voice of Bato. In Ghost in the Shell in Japan. And so what happened was uh, Billy Zane did, did the first film, and then they couldn't get him for the second film for some reason. He was unavailable, or too expensive, or he pooped in their salad, or did something. Like that. Anyway, uh, they, the Japanese clients asked who does, you know, who does the voice of Bato in America. They said Richard Epcar, so I got, the, I got the job, and I didn't have to audition for it. It was kind of nice. That information apparently sent those three guys fleeing for their lives. <laughs> Five guys. Those other guys. Goodbye. Billy Zane is scared the crap out of anybody. <laughs> Questions? Yes. yes. Um, this is about owning your own company. Have you noticed any conflict between your passion projects, like how you feel about Bato, um, and business decisions? Have those clashed at all? over starting the company? I'm not really no. sure what you're asking. Um, uh, if you've ever made poor business decisions because you cared so much about a project, or if you've had to drop a project. It hasn't happened. happened. Okay. It hasn't well, happened. Not saying that it, it couldn't happen, but it hasn't. I mean, we'll do things like, for example, I was, uh, I played Ziggurat, A, Ziggy, and Xenosaga, and I did the three games, and they were doing the series in Texas, and I would, I would have been willing to uh, go out there myself and, and do it. And of course, they would have paid me to do it, but uh, they wouldn't have necessarily paid for me to come out there. And that was just some character that I really loved doing, and I would like to have done the series, and I would have found a way to do it just because I love the character. And that wouldn't necessarily be a good business decision, but it would be something that I really love. It would be a passion decision, you know. So I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have things we love, and we, and we pursue those things, you know, and, and fortunately, we're, we're lucky, and we get to do other projects, too. I have a, a huge game I'm directing for Warner Brothers right now, and that's, uh, that's helping us a lot, so, you know, and that's turn, turning out to be a good thing. So. And these other films that I've been doing. Yeah, so, yeah, we've been, our company's actually been very busy lately, so that's been a good thing. Uh, yeah. But also, and uh, we're, we're just starting... I wrote a sitcom, and Richard and I are going to be doing it. So we'll tell you more about that. We'll be wearing that. that hat right there. <laughs> now, honey, I think you'll be wearing that hat. <laughs> you were asking. Uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier about having a, uh, maybe a little bit different vision of what Bato was uh, mm -hmm. from the director of, I guess, Standalone Complex. 
Yeah. What do you think is uh, could be added to it that it's not there? Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we, we both had uh, wanted him to have a, a sense of humor, which he does, and uh, I, I don't know, I just, there's just, I can't think of specific things, but I just know there was times in the booth where I was not 100% comfortable about the way he was asking me to portray the character, and it was really nice to be able to do that, you know, have the, have the power to do that and just do the character I want, and, you know, it's funny, um, there's this, there's this, tape that's out with Shatner doing the Star Trek cartoon and you can hear in the background the director's basically kind of telling him how to do the part and all of a sudden Shatner says don't tell me how to do it, it sickens me <laughs> and, and, and when I first heard that I go, what a dick <laughs> but you know the older I get and the more stuff I do the more I kind of realize, yeah, you know what, he's right that's his character, he knows what that character sounds like, he knows how to do that part he's great at it, he's perfect for that part he is, he is Captain Kirk. So, I mean, you know, there, there comes a point, I think, you know, you have to say, yeah, that's my character. I know how this character behaves. And it's kind of nice that, I mean, ultimately, you're kind of at the director's behest, unless you're William Shatner. But um, <laughs> normally you're at the director's behest and you kind of have to do what they tell you to do. But, uh, you know, it's nice to have that freedom to do it the way you really want to do it. And that was, that was wonderful. But, th but that also brings up another point, uh, that it, it's a very, very fine, razor-thin edge that you walk between do you choose what the director is advising you to do, or do you take the plunge and just say, you know, to hell with it, I'm doing what I want. Um, you, I, I, uh, I have worked with directors, and I go, Man, he does not understand, or she does not understand this at all. <clears throat> and if you feel, if you feel that the director really doesn't understand it, I mean, sometimes uh, it's kind of, and, and this isn't a good thing to say, but you have to say it. Sometimes you just have to say, you have to yes them to death, and then the minute you go, you do what you want, and and they do give up because. Um, this is what she does to me. <laughs> no, no, no. Because not with you, Richard. Richard's a fabulous director. He understands the story, and, and you know he understands uh, you know the the arc of the character. And he, but Richard, when Richard and I also work, he also knows that my script analysis and my character analysis is, is, is very, very defined. So many times he will, you know, bow to my, my feelings on it and say, um, <laughs> the boy can't come out this moment. Um, uh, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, but no, he will. He will say, you know, I, I understand what you mean, and you know, he'll he'll let me ride with it. But many times, it's like I was I was doing a film, and the director really didn't understand what it was that he was telling me to do, because he was having a producer tell him one thing, and he, somebody else was telling him to do another thing, and he was just out to lunch. It, it, was, it was really, really terrible. So I just did what I wanted to do, which was the right decision. But, um, but many times, if you're working with somebody, you do have to trust that the director has more information than you do, especially on a voice job, because on a voice job you walk in cold, and uh, you don't have the information about the whole of the script. You know, there's one little scene that you're seeing. And so it is wise to trust the director, because they know more, and they can be your guide that can lead you to a greater performance. Yeah, we, when we go in and do these, uh, you know, the, the anime stuff or the things that are that are done before, we go in and dub them. We we generally don't see them at all until we get in the booth. So it's basically we're cold reading it, and we're trying to make it fit in the uh, lip sync as well. So uh, the only time you really get to see the scripts is if you do original animation, like I'm on Legend of Korra on Nickelodeon. I play the play Chief Psychon on that, and they send us the scripts and we get to read them ahead of time. Before we 
going to get to uh, table. Turn that radio off. That's all right. <laughs> oh, you can hear me on the microphone. Um, so anyway, you know, you get you get the scripts and you can read them ahead of time and see what's going on. And then, you know, and and you know that that kind of work actually is easier because you're you're acting with a group and you're re reacting off of each other and it's fun. Whereas you know when you do the dubbing, you're basically you know, you're in there by yourself. You're trying to do lip sync, you're trying to make it sound natural, you're trying to, you know, that whole thing. So, anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Do you have a least favorite role or character that you've done in your career? You know, I, I, it's kind of like my kids, I love them all, you know, and I don't want to say anything bad about any of my kids, but uh, I really don't have a character per se that I don't like, but I, the, the thing that's hardest for me in this, uh, in over world now is, is these games where you're just basically screaming your ass off for four hours and there's a lot of them like uh, you know Call of Duty and uh, Spec Ops and uh, you know XCOM and all these games are basically you're in there screaming your ass off for hours and hours so those are those are the really tough ones and you know because you're, you're yelling over you know artillery and tanks and planes and gunshots and you know it's just all screaming so those those are to me the, those are the hard ones because it's just hard it's taxing on your on your boys. Yeah. Along the lines of uh, like a least or least favorite part, has there ever been a part that you really wanted but you didn't get? You were kind of disappointed that you weren't able to play that part. James Bond. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's roles we want to play that we don't get to play. Happens every day, you know. But we're very very fortunate that uh, we've got the body of work we have. Yeah, I, you know, there's, there may be a few out there that I haven't been able to play yet, and who knows, I mean, but I, uh, I really have been very, very lucky. I've played a wide variety of characters, and a bunch of different char characters that are close to me, but there's characters that are completely different than my voice, and when people hear them, they go, oh my god, I can't believe that's, that's Richard, it sounds nothing like him, and so th those are fun for me to just be a completely different character, you know, uh, so yeah, no, it's it's fun, and I I've, I've been very very lucky, you know, with a lot of different characters. So yeah, yeah. I apologize to us earlier. Just got here a couple minutes ago. If they ever get the U.S. production of Ghost in the Shell, they've been talking about for years. The years. live action one. Yeah, the live action. Around. Steven Spielberg's what, doing that. What would you give to play Boxer? <laughs> Do I have to go down on Spielberg? <laughs> <laughs> You know, obviously, I would love to be involved, and, and, and if there's any chance in, in hell that I could have anything to do with that, I would certainly love to be involved with it somehow. You know, it's. I mean, that's that's what's happening a lot. Is that all the films and all the games and all the anime that we've done in the past is they're yeah, now well. making them into films. Ghost in the Shell, Transformers, Speed Racer, you know. Now. Yeah. Uh, and Lupin the Third are doing a live action movie on it. So, so it, uh, you know, who would have thunk when we started this? Uh, yeah. We started 30 years ago doing this. And we had no idea that it was going to become what it became. That there, we used to go into the booth, we'd, we'd be there from like 9 till 3 in the morning. They were, we were kind of doing a bastard kind of animation, we thought. We had no idea that it was going to become what it became. And uh, we'd do all this stuff, and, and sometimes somebody would look at the other person and would say, will this ever see the light of day? And <clears throat> look what, look what it has ha that look what's stuff. happened. Yeah. <laughs> you That's know? really exploded this stuff, so it's great. She's talking about mostly when we did Robotech, we were, we were at the studio at like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and there was three studios running at the same time because they had a really short delivery date on this thing. So basically, you'd be doing your part in one studio, and then you'd run across the hall and do your part in the other studio, and then you'd run downstairs and do your part in that studio. And we'd be all, all night long, and we were running back and forth doing our part in different episodes, and it was, it was really nutty, and people would be sleeping on the stairs and in the halls. And, as a matter of fact, our son was like two, three years old, and he'd be sleeping on the stairs because we didn't have a babysitter all the time, so we brought him with us to the jobs. Yeah, he was definitely born in the trunk. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now he's the drummer on uh, Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark on Broadway, so. <clears throat> And actually, uh, on Sunday after the convention, we are going to go see him. Yeah, which New York, is, yeah we're excited. We're very see. excited about that. Any other questions? Questions? Yeah. Are we allowed to ask you to, like, say lines? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> could you say something like, Major, I love you? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's the one thing. Every ghost I think he's wanted to say that the whole time. <laughs> Major, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's, I mean, to me that, you know, that kind of stuff really makes it interesting. You know, here's a, here's a guy who's just basically, he really is in love with her. And basically she, she appreciates, I think she appreciates the fact that he's in love with her, but she doesn't have those feelings for him. And so. actually, if, if we were to jump ahead and do the subtext, she'd go, but, uh, I have to tell you, I'm gay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, you have such a deep range, Richard. Has anyone ever asked you, what's the highest you've ever... Well, heard? Joker's pretty high. He gets up there. And, uh, and I did I did this guy, Inspector Loki, Monster, I don't know if any of you guys saw that, or... I, I have this kind of high voice that I use for different characters occasionally, and, you know, it's kind of fun. And, and that's the, the great thing, it's like we both have a pretty big range, yeah. and um, that's the fun of it, is of voice acting, is it, I too have, you know, a deep voice. And you, you're not limited by, you know, your physicality. I can play babies, little girls, little boys, teenagers, <laughs> grandmas. You know. Well, you know that, that's that's to me that's the coolest part of voice acting yeah. is you can you can be any character you can vocally imagine. Whereas you know on, on film, television, you kind of have to be you're relegated to the way you appear. And it's just it's kind of it's to me in, in many ways voice acting is almost more creative than than other kinds of acting because you can just really do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You can look at me like that. That's true. <laughs> you know, they're different. It's, they it's different, a different you know art form. You can be, you, you can yeah, be a lot you of can, different characters that you, you can not be. But, 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 you know, when you're doing a role, it, and, and, you know, you're working really, really hard, you're not only working vocally, you're working, yeah, you're working physically, parts, you're working right. mentally, you're working emotionally. It's, um, you know, and those are all different muscles. Yes, so is your sphincter. What? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how do you feel about taking over the role from Mark Hamill of the Joker? Was it like... <laughs> he could have the Joker funny. back if I could have his Star Wars checks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know. That I, I can't really say that I've taken the role over from him. I'm certainly doing it in a few different games, which is really nice. I would love to do a series like he's done. Um, I think... I, I'm, I know he's done a great job. Believe it or not, I've never heard his Joker to this day. And people always say, oh, you're trying to sound like Mark. And it's like, um, I've never heard him do it. So I don't know that. And, 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 and one of the reasons I haven't heard him do it is for that reason. I don't want people to say I'm trying to imitate somebody or do their or version. Or, I don't know what he sounds like. And I'm, I know he's good because everybody loves him, but I've never heard him. So, Wait a second. Yeah. Doesn't that mean you have to consciously avoid Batman the animated series? I haven't really seen too much of it. You guys have to remember, I work so much. We don't, we get, don't, we don't get a chance to watch our own stuff, let alone other people's stuff. You guys know more about the stuff that's out there than we do. And I, you know, people say, well, don't you play the games you're in? And no. <laughs> no. We had a, I did this uh, Transformer game. Uh, I played Skywarp and War for Cybertron. And they had this huge uh, rap party after we finished it. And they had these big screens. And, and you're supposed to, I don't, does anyone have that game you don't, Anybody have that game? Well, there's in the beginning, you're like in a cave. you got to get out of the cave to go on the mission. Well, I'm, I'm stuck in the cave for like an hour. I couldn't get out of the, the bloody cave. I'm going, okay, that's it. I'm not playing this game anymore. <laughs> so I'm stuck in the cave. I couldn't get out. So that's, I'm not good at playing. I'm not good at playing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm thrilled to be doing the Joker. I, it's, it, anytime you can do an iconic character like that, and he certainly is an iconic character, uh, it's a thrill. It's a wonderful thrill. And... 
And it's always hard when you have somebody like Mark Hamill or somebody like that. It's just like when I took over Handsome from Billy Zane. There's a lot of people who love Billy Zane's version of it. I've never heard Billy Zane do Handsome either. And, uh, you know, it's, people get attached to it. Listen, I'm a huge James Bond fan. When, you know, Sean Connery stepped down, I was very disappointed. And, you know, you, you know they never quite measure up to the first guy that you see. And it's hard. Listen, I can relate to that, too. Uh, and I understand that. But, uh, you know, I do my best. I, I try to do my best. I have fun. And I have a, you know, I, the Joker's been a, a blast to do. And I'm thrilled every time they bring me back to do him in another game. And to be part of, of the Batman world is, is very cool for me. I, we, got, we actually met Bob Kane one day. He created yeah, Batman. We did. And what he said to me was, and I swear to God, this is true. We're, we're talking, and he goes, he goes, Richard, you know, what you need to do is you need to come up with a character like Batman. I said, oh, great, Bob, thanks. That's, that, that's wonderful. I'll get right on. <laughs> it's like, oh, is that all? Just come up with a character like Batman. Okay, no, that's easy. That's easy. No, no sweat. So that's kind of funny. He's he he was